it is my great pleasure um, to welcome our first keynote of uh, INA 2021, Courtney McClellan. Um, Courtney is the current innovator in residence at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. Uh, and she has a long history of making art and sculpture and thinking socially at the intersection of media and civic life. And most recently, she's been thinking a lot about annotation, um, which is why she's here. And she's gonna share that way uh, thinking with us today. Courtney, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation to speak here at Hypothesis. And I wanna further thank um, Hypothesis scholar and residence, Rami Kalir for making this connection. And I'm just thrilled to speak with you all today. What I sort of thought I would do today is is introduce myself just a touch more, um, but focus on talking about contemporary artists using annotation because that's what I am. I'm a studio artist. And then the bulk of the time we'll spend talking about the development of my Library in Congress Innovator in Residence Experiment Speculative Annotation, which will launch this July. So in, in just a few short weeks. Again, just sort of a, a follow up of that introduction. So I'm a visual research based artist and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my work covers a range of media, including sculpture, performance, photography and writing. And the project I made for the Innovator in Residence program is the first uh, web based application I've ever made. Um, in subject, my work often addresses speech and civic engagement. And I've served as a studio art faculty at Virginia Commonwealth University, the University of Georgia, Georgia State University. Um, I uh, have my MFA from Tufts University, and most recently I was the 2019-2020 Roman J. Witt Artist in Residence at the University of Michigan. So just a little bit about the Innovator in Residence um, experiment and program. So as I said, my project is called Speculative Annotation. The program at large um, is a creative research residency funded by the Library of Congress Labs. And innovators such as myself work with Library of Congress collections and staff to create a short term experimental public project, in this case, a public art project that intends to reach the work, life and imagination of the American people. So in order to kind of start thinking about annotation and sort of how I became interested in annotation, I think it's important to think about how contemporary artists are using annotation. Um, and it's a trend that I've seen in the last, oh, certainly five or six years, but probably reaches much farther back. Um, and I've seen many artists using annotation in their practice. Um, and so I thought I'd share just a couple of artists that I think are using it in interesting ways. Um, and this will really just be a brief touch on them. So hopefully if you're interested, you can follow up more about their work. Uh, but I wanted to give just a little bit of context. Um, so this first artist I'm sharing is Bethany Collins. Um, uh, Bethany Collins is an artist living in Chicago and makes work about the intersection of race and language. Um, Collins regularly responds to historical documents, songs, and literature. Collins uses annotation in one form or another in almost all of her work. Um, and in this case, I'm showing uh, an example of Collins' uh, erasure series in which she uh, erases uh, printed text using a black magic eraser so that much of the text is unreadable. Um, so it's really kind of leaving behind just some kind of uh, trace of language uh, and then sort of highlighting certain aspects of the text. I think this work is particularly that she did a series about the, uh, the Odyssey. Um, another artist using annotation is Wendy Redstar. Uh, Wendy Redstar is a multidisciplinary artist who, um, in this case, uh, created a series of annotations for an exhibition at Mass Mocha in North Adams, Massachusetts. Um, this is particular annotation is an annotation of an elder um, uh, in her tribe. Um, and so this is an annotation of Medicine Man. So a little bit about Wendy Redstar. So raised on a Crow reservation in Montana, Wendy Redstar's work, and this comes directly from her website, is informed both by her cultural heritage and her engagement with many forms of creative expression, including photography, sculpture, video, fiber arts, and performance. An avid researcher of archives and historical narratives, Redstar seeks to incorporate and recast her research offering new and unexpected perspectives in work that is at once inquisitive, witty, and unsettling. 
The last artist that I would just touch on today to think about annotation is Laura Owens. Um, and so Laura Owens is primarily a painter, um, but in some ways, especially with the topic thinking about social annotation, I thought uh, Owens was a great example. Um, as part of her mid-career survey exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, uh, Owens created a series of emojis that could be downloaded by attendees. And so this you can see on the right is the emoji palette that she created so that people could annotate uh, each other's language with her, you know, unique and specific emojis. And these could be downloaded and used um, on the premises at the Whitney, but also at large. So these were th things that sort of left the gallery, jumped off the wall and existed in people's kind of social annotation life of, of communication. So I think this brings up kind of one broad question, and I certainly don't intend to speak for all artists, um, but mostly to kind of touch on an idea about why artists might be interested in annotation or why artists annotate. In many ways, it's the same reason scholars, journalists, and scientists annotate, to share opinion, to record information, to provide context, or to react to the archive. Um, annotation is also a form of reframing or protest and offers the ability to draw attention to resonant passages or ideas. In addition to written text as a form of annotation, um, artists also have other tools at their disposal to share information. So some of these tools we'll kind of look at a little bit later, but something like line quality. So how the line is made, is it thick, is it thin, is it kind of wiggle, does it um, gesture in some ways, color choice, the ability to collage and or a way to layer images. So in thinking about me specifically, as I was looking at these other artists and found uh, so much inspiration in how they were using annotation, um, I realized that I was less interested in how I might annotate something and more interested in how others annotate. Um, I'm somebody who has always loved finding uh, notes in library books um, uh, and who finds you know, fascinating uh, kind of pieces of detritus on the street that have text on and that people have shared, um, grocery list, et cetera. And so I particularly began thinking about um, how other people annotated and how we might be able to facilitate that through a project with the Library of Congress. So I was particularly thinking about students and teachers as an audience um, for, for many reasons, both because I think they could actively use the tool and also because I think uh, they sometimes are an underserved art audience. So I wanted to think about how I might stage a space for them to annotate historical material and primary sources from the Libraries Congress. So just a little bit um, to kind of articulate exactly what uh, speculative annotation is. Speculative annotation is an open source dynamic web application and public art project. The tool presents a unique mini collection of free to use items from the Library of Congress for students teachers and users of all ages to annotate through captions, drawings, and other types of mark making. Working with curators of the library and students and teachers in the classroom, I developed speculative annotation to provide a way for students to speak back to history. Speculative annotation connects items from the past with the day-to-day -day experience of users. It was made with a K through 12 audience in mind with the hope that the primary sources from the library's collections would be used by educators. The items are shared with contextual aids, including curators, annotations, and links to additional resources for further research on the library's website. Um, the tool, as I said, will launch this July. And I wanted to go ahead and note a few important people to the project. Um, so speculative annotation really wouldn't have been possible without a team. Um, I am not a developer, and so that was one of the kind of important things to build a team so to, uh, to facilitate the creation of this project. And of course, everyone was inputting on uh, creative choices um, as well as technical ones. So other people I wanted to kind of highlight are Jamie Mayer, Senior, Senior Innovation Specialist at the LC Labs, Adam Arling, who was the developer for the project, Jess Vu, who was our uh, UX consultant, and Olivia Graham, who was a graphic design intern. So just to kind of touch on why we call it speculative annotation and why that was important. So for me, um, I have been defining the speculation and annotation as the following. Speculation is engaging in or projecting onto future events. It's theorizing and imagining without knowing. In our case, we're thinking of annotation simply as a note of explanation or comment added to a text or diagram. 
So examples include margin notes, highlighting, and thought bubbles. And we'll see examples of all of those in the tool. An additional question is why think about speculative? Um, that's sort of been an ongoing conversation and certainly was important to the inspiration of the project. So when thinking about speculative annotation, the tool enables students to analyze and examine historical materials through hands-on engagement. History is an enduring mystery. Speculation is a form of investigation. This tool allows students to question and examine the point of view of the creators of primary sources. In response, students' annotations are an interpretation. We are asking students to make their insights visible and in doing so, join history's record. So that's kind of one important factor is that uh, we're wanting students to develop some visual literacy skills in using the tool, and we want them to uh, find value and let them know that we find value in their uh, joining history's record. Um, speculative is also a reference to speculative fiction, a term that covers fantasy to science fiction. While the presentation is going to focus on the topic of annotation, the essay I selected to annotate um, to annotate speaks to the topics of speculation and imagination. It is from science fiction writer Ursula K. Le Guin's Introduction to the Left Hand of Darkness, and this is an essay that I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed and have used in many contexts. Um, I hope you will annotate it with consideration for how Le Guin sees the relationship between the past, present, and future, as well as the role of the artist in relation to this, interpreting this particular topic. So some goals we set out for speculative annotation. And I'll say that my residency started in September and it's a year long residency. So these were sort of goals we articulated very early on into the project um, and tried to kind of keep on returning to when we were making uh, design decisions and choices along the way. Uh, we wanted to place K through 12 students in direct conversation with primary sources from the library's collection. We wanted to share these items with context, for example, asking curators and experts to annotate the items so students and educators can understand their history. And I'll return to that particular goal because that was one of the biggest um, changes in design decisions we made. We wanted to provide a space for users of all ages to have a depth of experience with individual items from the collection. We wanted to connect items from history with the day-to-day -day experience of citizens and application users. And we wanted to explore technical solutions for supporting deep engagement with the singular item across formats at the library. So I'll say that's another kind of difference here is that many of the previous, so there have been three previous innovators and in residents and most of them, they have done projects dealing with large data sets. And so this was a slightly different project. We were selecting individual items um, to try to inspire deep engagement with students. So I'm going to show a brief video of just uh, what the tool looks like and kind of demoing a small annotation. So as you can see here, um, there's a toolbar to the left. There is the ability to save and download at the top. You can also access some of your saved annotations in the top right if you're working on something. And one of the goals we set out is to make things very simple. That was something early on we heard from students um, to have kind of simple choices as not to make something so complicated. So there's uh, a text tool, there's a drawing tool, a highlighting tool, um, a shape tool to kind of isolate aspects of an image, and then the stamps. So students can jump right in to starting to annotate. Um, there's a limited color palette at the top. So some of this was to, uh, and we kind of kept on going back to how is this an annotation tool, not necessarily a design tool, although it employs visual uh, cues and material and hopefully um, is visually engaging. And the item we're looking at that's being annotated is the telegram from Aaron Copeland, who is a co composer. Um, so that was a large portion of our time, and I'll talk about that in a bit, about even just selecting uh, items that we think would be exciting and viable for classroom users to use. So it's not a tool where they can pick anything on the library site, but instead currently there's a subset of about 40 items that people can select from to annotate. And there were some kind of technical limitations about the tool. So again, that's partially why it can't be used at, uh, across the entire uh, LOC uh, wide. Um, 
there were sort of limitations. It was also that we couldn't have a server. So everything is accessible um, and saved in the browser. And this, we're looking at the metadata panel right now. And then there's also the uh, staff annotation, which I'll talk about later. So that's just a very basic demo and introduction to the tool itself. So the process of creating speculative annotation, um, it was a highly collaborative and creative process. Um, and throughout the process, my team and I conducted three kinds of research. The first being studio experimentation and design. The second being collaborative curation of the speculative annotation mini collection with library staff. And lastly, the user testing class visits with students and educators. So a little bit about the studio experimentation. Um, I wanted to stage a space where students felt valued with a conversation about shared history. So part of me was trying to do this to make this visually appealing, to give them uh, freedom to respond in, in the ways they'd be interested in, and also to provide them hopefully with some interesting tools. Um, in preparation for this, I worked in a printmaking studio to explore mark making and printing processes in order to consider annotation as an artistic medium. Mono printing and collage particularly inform the tool and can be seen in the hand cut stamps. So one of the things that's sort of, I think most unique about the tool is that there's a series of hand cut stamp, uh, stamps that uh, I cut myself that students can use to code or layer or encode by that. I mean like add, uh, you know, exclamation points, add stars to things that they're interested in, use them as kind of visual cues um, in the actual uh, act of annotating. So I wanted the application to feel touched and handmade even in its digital format. Um, so that was another thing is thinking again about my love of finding notes in library books was this was partially to make something feel touched and unique and personal. Um, these principles guided many visual choices in the resulting site. Along with my team, we designed tools and features and speculative annotation to contrast the visually, to visually contrast the archival material presented in the mini collection. The color palette was inspired by colors regularly used for annotation, like fluorescent highlighter yellow, diverging from the muted colors of many of the aged artifacts and allowing for annotations to be highly visible. Many of the stamp forms, like an arrow or a pointing finger, also allow users to draw attention to particular aspects of the historical items, while thought bubbles and punctuation marks offer a way to share ideas, opinions, and emotional reactions. The curation of the mini collection. Um, this was where I would say a, a large portion of our time went. Um, working with curators, library staff, and field experts, we developed the mini collection in parallel with the creation of the speculative annotation website. Library curators provide a host of contemporaneous examples of historical annotation from the collection. Rosenwald and rare book curators, for example, shared that medieval manuscript materials that included ample margin space with the expect expectation that scholars would add their own notes. At the time, books were rare and expensive to create, and scholars would often travel to a manuscript and document their findings directly in the same book. These historical examples of annotation influenced the layout of the tool, for example, the need for extra space around an item to allow for such annotation. Library staff also proposed works to be included in the speculative annotation mini collection. Through conversation with experts from around the library, several key themes related to storytelling and imagination emerged among the items. And that was again, part of that speculative question. How do we invite storytelling and imagination through the tools and through the items? Um, the topics that covered um, and regularly addressed these concerns included civil and human rights, the creative process and technological development. Um, we worked with 12 different divisions at the library to create this collection for students and teachers. And so much of our time was sort of talking about to them about their needs, finding out um, what might in their collections might be a standalone item that could be um, engaging and inspiring to students and educators.
uh, we did user testing. Um, and again, that's sort of one of those things where from my kind of perspective, I thought about it a lot as like community outreach, but we were also, of course, doing user testing to find out what students and teachers um, might want from a tool and how they might utilize it. Um, so that was sort of a big part of the efforts, particularly last fall, even into the spring where I was visiting classes while we were carrying out these other kinds of research. And right now we're looking at the list of classes that I visited, um, which we would not have been able to create this tool without their engagement and support. And particularly, um, I'm thankful to them during a, a really challenging and difficult teaching year. Um, I virtually visited classes throughout the development of the tool. These visits began with sharing the library's free to use digital collection and asking students to annotate them with the applications with which they were already familiar. Um, we learned from the writings and drawings students made and listened to their advice about what they wanted. Um, when the tool was prototyped, students and educators tested the site, giving feedback and brainstorming solutions to educational and technical challenges. For instance, students shared that they most often hand annotated with a highlighter. So a highlighter was added to the toolbar. They also wanted to be able to zoom deeper into images, allowing for a more detailed view of a given item. Finally, students suggested ways to make the tool more user friendly. For example, they requested that the te text tool be contained within a bounding box, allowing students to write longer annotations that could wrap to multiple lines. Speculative annotation aims to foster visual literacy and interpretation of primary sources across subjects. The tool is informed by methods of historical analysis, literary close reading, and studio art critique. And I think that brings up something important. Um, you know, you can see here the classes we visited. Uh, we didn't want to make a tool that was just for um, history classes. We thought that these primary sources had uh, need and had utility in uh, art classes, in photography classes, in language arts classes. Um, so that was really important to the, the practice and visit too, that how do we make a tool that is flexible enough that it could be used um, in an elementary school uh, language arts class and in a high school um, AP government class potentially. So I'm going to share just a couple of examples of student annotations. These were some of the ones we collected and we studied and learned from. Um, and we did receive special permission to show this work of minor, so we did um, go through that process. And again, just simply by having them share these with us, uh, we were really engaged with what they wanted, what they used, what was um, exciting to them, how might the tool uh, be transformed. And of course, as I already said, they gave some really concrete and useful uh, feedback as well as sharing these annotations with us. I know as the topic and thinking about uh, the hypothesis tool about the social annotation, I did want to address that in this talk. Um, so currently, students cannot co-annotate on speculative annotation simultaneously. Um, that was something, again, that was limited by our inability to have a server. So although students cannot edit, edit the same item on separate devices in real time, they can share. Um, so they can download and share these annotations with one another and their teachers. Um, it could be a direct email. It's, it lives in a PNG file or it could be um, sharing using hashtag um, annotate LOC, and that's something uh, that we hope we'll see people activating. Um, we also hope that teachers uh, can share their tools and resources and ways they've used speculative annotation in a similar manner. Um, in the most simple and direct way, we do hope that people, teachers might be uh, willing and thinking about modeling the annotation for students. Um, so the biggest addition, and I think it was sort of I, to be my favorite addition to the tool as we've been working on it, is uh, LC staff annotations. Um, so I think I noted in the demonstration that there was a small button on the lower left hand or a button that was orange um, that said LC staff annotation. And as we were talking to staff um, and, you know, as I mentioned, kind of speaking to the 12 divisions we were working with, we regularly heard concerns about how to provide context 
Um, and rather than seeing that as a problem, I really saw that as an opportunity. So uh, you can see that there was a metadata panel to provide very straightforward information about who made it, where it was made, when it was made. And there was also links to kind of additional research students and teachers could use. Um, but I thought it would be interesting and to provide a way to have some personal um, understanding of, of annotations from the curators themselves. So I think this provided a couple of things. One, it's a model of how the annotations might look and what they might be used for. Um, but I also think it's a way to kind of put students not just in conversation with history, but in conversation with library staff. Um, and so, uh, and in fact, this for me was inspired by a project uh, that was created um, at the Isabella Stewart Gardner in which a contemporary artist asked staff and uh, security guards to describe the famously missing paintings. So I wanted uh, staff at the library to spend some time describing and looking at the tool, looking at the items that's from their area and annotating them. Um, so it was sort of a great joy. And we asked them to annotate with several topics in mind. So one, it could be providing additional historical context. Um, it could be telling a personal narrative. It could be asking questions for students to respond to. But about half of the items in our collection have these unique um, LC staff annotations that students can, can access. So this one I'm sharing right now is an annotation of a Rosenwald manuscript material that we are including in the selection by um, curator Stephanie Stillo. Uh, and I also just love how wonderfully visual it is. This is an annotation of a photograph of the pecan sheller strike by Maria Guadalupe Pardita. And this annotation was another kind of great addition and enriching. Um, Lupita, who we're describing here, uh, also, also created a podcast associated with this tool. So we wanted to kind of uh, engage the students in, in the story that she was telling, and then hopefully they'll go listen to the podcast she created also. So it's also a way, I think, of hopefully kind of drawing people into the, the larger story of each item in the collection. And lastly, this is an annotation of a Patsy Mink manuscript material done by Liz Novara. So this, these annotations, I, I hope, will really enrich the project and also um, uh, kind of exist as uh, gems to find in the tool itself. Before leaving, I wanted to give an additional thanks to Adam Arling, Jess Vu, and uh, Olivia Graham, who were integral to this. And I want to give additional thanks to Jamie Mayers, the LC Labs team, Dr. Remy Collier, and Antero Garcia, uh, Emily Kirkpatrick, the National Council of English Teachers, Kalina Stasiak, a printmaker, and Josh Hadro and the team at Triple IF. Um, these all these were all people who were vital to this project, um, in addition to the area specialists and um, the uh, many teachers who, who gave their time and resources and students who engaged the project along the way. And from here, I'm gonna uh, invite you to annotate on the selected at, uh, text, which is again, the introduction essay to the left hand of darkness by Ursula K. Le Guin. And I'm also available for questions. Are there any questions I can answer? Hey, yes, Courtney. <clears throat> I've been kind of monitoring the chat and the questions that they come through, and thank you so much for that presentation. It's really refreshing to step away from the textual and really immerse ourselves in the visual. A um, couple of questions here, and then maybe we could move over to the um, the reading that you've selected for annotation. Um, to start out um, actually with one of Alex's questions. If there were, uh, I can show it on the stage actually if there were unexpected uses of the tool, subverting it for other needs, making the tool their own and making it appropriate for their context. Did you, does that resonate with you as something that happened during the project? So I'm, I'm wanting to make sure I understand the question. So I think there's be one thing of what, like, were the students subverting the, um, the tool? 
So there's one thing is that the only way to use the tool is to use items from the library's collection. So it's not a space where somebody could upload an additional image so they can't annotate something extra. The tool itself is open source. So we're hoping that other cultural heritage institutions might uh, want to reuse the tool in another context. Um, and so that that's sort of one one uh, intention and hope in the larger process. Great, yeah, and, and Alex did confirm that you had uh, anticipated his meaning, right? Okay, good. Um, and I will say that I see that Jamie Mayers, the senior in innovation specialist that I work with, is in the chat and answering probably some of the technical questions. Um, we so, could also invite Jamie up on stage if that would be helpful. <laughs> Jamie, do you want to do that? Or are you just going to field questions in the chat? She'll have to chat respond. Okay. okay. Until, um, maybe uh, while she's thinking about that, um, we could, uh, another, another question from Chris Aldrich, and I'll again show it on the stage here. Does the tool have a way for students to take their annotations or data with them, perhaps to put it in a notebook, commonplace book for future thought review or building upon? So the one place, so uh, again, because it doesn't have a server, there's no way of like logging back onto a different computer. However, the information does uh, stay on, uh, you know, and within the kind of browser that it's in. So for instance, in my case, I have many saved annotations that I can pull up because I'm reusing my same laptop. So you can reaccess those as long as you haven't cleared your cache. However, there's not currently a space that you would sign on again, like I said, from a different location um, and be able to access another annotation. Got it. And um, actually your colleague did say that they would be willing to come up on stage. So I'm gonna see if I can make that happen as well. Give me a second here. Hi, I'm not very camera ready. I'm li literally in overalls, um, <laughs> like responding to people's chats. But I am I am happy to answer. Um, there's some like technical questions about accessibility that I can happily speak to. I saw several of them and I was trying to answer like one by one, but it might be easier if I just share it here. But only if that's helpful. I can continue to do it in the chat, whatever you guys want. Oh, let's share, Jamie. I put this one question up on stage so people could see the context. Yeah, so, um, the Library of Congress, when it produces applications in um, in production, they have to be Section 508 compliant. My team in LC Labs has a different workflow because we're an R and D like part of the library, and so we create like fast build prototypes to test a concept to see how popular it is with the public. And we do this through a number of ways, um, but one of them is through um, art projects and that we sponsor such as hosting residents like Courtney. So hopefully that helps for context. So Spike Love Annotation is an experiment. It's produced as such. Um, we host it for a short amount of time. So it'll be hosted by the library for two years. Um, and then if the library decides to adopt it and to put it into production, then it um, goes through the process, you know, as required by a federal institution with 508 compliance, etc. Um, so hopefully that helps for context, because I don't think that that is, um, you know, apparent, especially because the application certainly doesn't look like a prototype. It's beautiful. Um, so that's one thing I saw. And then um, another one is, I was saying this in the chat, but in case like people didn't see it because I was typing it fast. So um, there are several colors from the color palette that, that do have accessibility compliance. And it's a little bit more complicated because there's a light mode and a dark mode. So there's colors that have accessibility compliance like based on what the background mode is. And there's also um, tags for the tools. Um, so that's there, but I, in general, because the tool is so heavily visual, no, it hasn't been tested with a screen reader and the tool is open source and we would absolutely love it if anyone um, had feedback or wanted to fork it and had ways that they thought that the tool could be m more accessible, like, you know, in the short amount of time um, that we're hosting it. So we did a dance, basically, we kind of do with all of these experiments where we made it so that it could be accessible, you know, with the resources that we had. And then if the library chooses to adopt it, which we really hope it does, it's been pretty amazing so far and it seems to be useful, but 
can't say for sure what the organization will do, um, then it will meet all of the um, requirements before it goes live live as a permanent tool. That was great. So thanks for being willing to join us uh, on this for the moment here and actually pop on the stage. Um, that looks like there might be one other question from Mark, and then maybe we could turn over to um, doing some annotation on on your selected text, Courtney. Um, so I'm going to put it on stage, uh, uh, and this is from Mark. What if you could have a server, and what if there was a button to save annotation.png, an image file, to the Internet Archive? Have you imagined what it might be like to actually save these artifacts digitally? So I'll, I'll try to answer, and then Jamie, if you have a different thought on this. Um, I mean, so the biggest desire we've had for a server is so that it could be more of a social annotation, so that students could be on the same image and be writing, and also that they could share um, share them more easily that way. So that's sort of a long-term dream. Uh, we haven't gone heavily down that path because of limited uh, expectations because it's uh, a government institution about collecting personal data. And so we've always known that not having a server was one of the limitations. But of course, um, if somebody else was using it or if um, there was another way to kind of manage this, the thought that students could co-annotate or that a teacher could have, you know, every sort of it's, you know, in many ways, what's uh, fun about a uh, hypothesis that people could be all in the, the one image together and be sharing ideas. Um, so we love that possibility. We just know that currently that's not feasible. Jamie, would you and think? And I'll add one thing. Yeah, I'll add one thing to that, which is that um, we um, spent money, Courtney spent money and we spent money, um, uh, did a lot of extra work with our developers so that actually the architecture for this to be set up with a server is all in place. It's just that as a part of the context that I was giving before, that this is a prototype, that we don't use servers with the experiments that we launch. That's something that will happen later, um, you know, if the library chooses to support it as a permanent app and it goes into production, um, then it'll put resources into that and setting up all of the, you know, best practices for how to store PII or not, et cetera. Um, so that's just a part of the technical constraints of, of this um, particular project. Um, but the architecture is there and it was really fun. I mean, if, if folks are interested, it seems like they are in some of the technical aspects. The way that the tool works and has been set up for simultaneous annotation, and this includes layering between the curator annotations, you know, being able to layer on top of those or layer, you know, having students in the same classroom layer their annotations on top of each other. The architecture set up in the JSON manifest file, incredibly lightweight without PII, so that basically if there was a server, I don't know if this is interesting to people, but I'm just going to share it, um, that essentially um, the app is set up so that those markings um, are packed into a JSON file without PII. And so your server is essentially hosting this really, really lightweight JSON file, and then um, it just recalls it back or recalls like multiple ones to layer. So the, the architecture is Adam Arling, our developer is amazing. And he set up a really eloquent like solution for this that would be really kind of sustainable and lightweight for any organization to host. So if there are folks out there that would like to use speculative annotation in that way, it's really lightweight. And then we also heard from folks as well. I love the idea of internet archive. Um, as a way of archiving um, things. Um, and the other thing I was gonna say was that we also had some suggestions about using GitHub um, as a way of um, acting as a server affordance. So if you were a GitHub user, we, you know this, this app could be something that you could connect to your GitHub repo and it would store your annotation manifest files like within your own repo for you to recall them again and use them in the tool. Um, so that's how it's set up and I hope that was useful. I think it was. There's a lot of um, really deep technical geeks here in the, in the audience, and they're already grooving on that. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, if, uh, as we move over to the essay, um, if someone here wanted to maybe get involved on in a technical level or start to think about this, what, how might they? How might they do that? Is there a way for for citizens to to get involved? Oh my gosh, please, please do. We, it is a lot of overhead for us to um, 
uh, get things published in a public like Library of Congress GitHub repo because obviously it needs to be scanned and everything so that we're not accidentally passing you know, bugs like to folks who wanna fork it or package it. So we do a lot of work and we put a lot of resources into making sure these tools are um, open source. And that is exactly what we would like to see. I mean, we would like for you to get involved. I'll be one of the repo managers. There'll be other people on the lab staff. Um, we would love issues pushed. We'd love to see people forking this. We would love to see people using this in different contexts. I saw chats about, you know, if someone wanted to set it up, like using um, GitHub as a, a repo, like in the architecture that I was describing. Um, please do. And there's other ways that you can get in touch um, with us at LC Labs on Twitter. Um, we're a technical team at the library. We love hosting conversations about the experiments that we put out. So that's one way. Um, and we also have a newsletter that you can sign up to and you can find that information at labs.loc.gov. And then once the tool launches in July, Courtney is going to be um, doing a road show um, at a bunch of different venues. And we would love to do some type of community Twitter chat. So um, maybe there's a way for people um, in the hypothesis community to get involved in that. Great, those all sound like really really good ways to get involved. There's a lot of people here who <laughs> spend a lot of time on Git, Git forums of different kinds, not only GitHub, but others too. Um, well. One of the reasons I wanted to invite Courtney to come back and, and kind of close this now, because one of the reasons that um, we're working with this uh, virtual manifestation of I Annotate to um, have um, readings associated with sessions so that the conversation can actually start to happen maybe even before the session, during the session, and then continue on after. So it's actually okay if we don't have a whole lot of time now to do any kind of synchronous annotation, but if we would, Courtney, maybe we could just um, introduce the idea to them and maybe I'll share my screen so I can show it up here on the screen. Uh, give me one, just one second here. And then I will um, also uh, ask you to explain why you picked this, um, this document. And the first thing I just wanted to let people know is that um, in, the, in the external program, uh, for this conference. There's a program built into AirMeet, the, the platform that we're meeting in that where you can see the schedule and get to things. But there's a web document outside of the um, <clears throat> outside of the uh, platform where uh, every uh, session is listed. And then as we get the session details for each one, there will be a link to that. And so um, if I navigate now, you'll see the session details for, for Courtney's uh, session here today. And you'll see that she has um, a place for an annotated reading, which is actually this excerpt from Ursula K. Le Guin's Left Hand of Darkness. And so would you, and I'll just say that you can open the hypothesis sidebar and you can see, ah, Heather Staines has already started to annotate on it, a known, a known, per, a known annotator. Um, but you can sign up or and or log into your hypothesis account um, right from there. So, Courtney, would you explain why you picked this text uh, to sure. focus? Sure. Um, well, knowing the audience, I, I thought that the, the talk itself was going to focus a lot on the idea of annotation, um, but I didn't want the term speculative to get lost in the mix. And so, for me, this is an essay that really introduces, um, you know. Ursula K. Le Guin is often going to use the term science fiction, but I would kind of suggest that we're speaking about a more kind of broad speculative fiction, too, um, and thinking about uh, what speculation does. And so this is a writer who writes fiction talking about the utility of speculating, imagining, thinking about the past and the future and the way they relate to one another, which is, of course, um, the hope here that students will annotate the past and it will help them imagine the future. So it's sort of this this time travel goal, um, this uh, kind of poetic text that is also still very, I think, accessible and concrete. And it's a text that I love and that I have taught in, in many contexts and often like coming back to. So hopefully it will be an enjoyable read that will help kind of uh, inspire uh, some interesting thoughts about speculation, imagination, the past, the future, and certainly was integral into me uh, proposing and creating speculative annotation. So this is sort of an inspiration text, I would say. 
That's great. And we can see people already doing that. And so we invite everyone throughout the conference to come back to these documents and um, continue the conversation there. We can have a lot of ineffable chat here in the, in the conference venue itself, but when we have it out on these documents with annotation, it'll uh, it'll actually have a more lasting quality to it. Well, I really want to thank you, uh, Courtney, for being here today and kicking off this conference. It was just fantastic to hear your, what you're doing and your thoughts on other artists at work. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to kind of leave us with as a parting gift <laughs> as we head on to the rest of the conference? I mean, hopefully the text itself will will do some of that, but really with this idea about how annotation uh, is visual as well as information. It is artistic um, in any format, the way the text you choose, the way it's laid out, there's information in that kind of method too. And so um, I would just sort of encourage everybody to keep on thinking about how annotation uh, is, is a artistic, artful gesture as well as a information, educational, informative gesture, and that those two things can fit together beautifully. So hopefully um, we'll, we'll see more of that. Well, uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm sure we'll see um, all sorts of emojis flying across the screen <laughs> now and chat, chat going on. Um, there is a little emoji button on the bottom that you can use to send little signals to the screen, which is a form of annotation as well. Um, I'll just let everybody know that you can also visit the lounge area here in AirMeet and you can actually meet up. You can sit down at a table and meet with other people. So if you wanted to have a conversation maybe with someone that you were chatting with here in the session, you could just go to the lounge right now and start to have that. We will be having our next session starting in just a, about five minutes. It's um, a panel on digital literacies. Uh, and so I hope you'll tune in for that. Um, and we're here all week, right? We're starting every day, noon Eastern, running till uh, four, the official program. And then four to five, we're having a social hour where you get to bring your favorite annotation and talk about it in the crowd. So thank you, Courtney. Um, thank you all. Thanks for having me.